Checking in on the second congressional district race tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. So tonight we meet Joy Fox. She's running for Congress to replace Jim Langevin. She used to work for Jim Langevin, and she didn't get the endorsement, which is, hmm, you know, I will tell you, knowing Joy for a long time, that she is, in my humble judgment, completely confident to be a congressman. The question is, there's a big difference between governance and campaigning to get the opportunity to govern. And the race has not looked particularly bullish for her, but you know what? That's why they play the games, right? They play the game in order to be able to get the results. So we'll talk to Joy about that coming up here momentarily. Just a couple of notes, though. Um, this was in the news this week. Uh, in, in a big way, uh, Governor McKee had to break a 5-5 tie on the Commerce Board to get a refinance approved on the project, the details of which we have covered in details, sometimes we could say ad nauseum, really. Uh, but the money matters, and the shift in the financing is something that you can read about. I will tell you the politics of it, and everything is politics, right, in this campaign season, are really fascinating. The governor had to break a 5-5 tie on the Commerce Board in order to make this thing work. And what's fascinating about it is that there are Helena Folk supporters, including her brother, on this Commerce Board. That's okay. You're allowed to support candidates and be on the board. But politics certainly won the day. And what's fascinating to me is that the governor um, you know, moves this across the finish line, right? And Helena Folk says, well, you know, I would, uh, I, I'd be with Pawtucket, but, you know, I would have done a whole different ballgame here. I would have got some more equity, and I would have figured out a new formula, and I would be a lesser burden to the taxpayers. But there are some taxpayer protections, but I don't know. I don't know. Right? Nellie Gorbea is like, oh, geez, I, oh, I love Pawtucket, but, boy, this is a leadership problem because I would have reformulated it a whole different way. That's the value of being a challenger, not having to make the decisions. Now, look. Incumbents shouldn't cry a river because they have built-in opportunities and advantages as well. But let me leave this question with you on the soccer stadium in Pawtucket. What if Dan McKee couldn't get enough votes to get the tie so he could move it across the line? Remember, that board's not his. Everything he has inherited in terms of appointments and the like comes from Gina Raimondo, right? What if he failed to get it across? What would the headlines be then? McKee failed to deliver for Pawtucket. If I were the governor, I would have delivered for Pawtucket. So it's really interesting. In the game of politics, sometimes you can't win for losing. So you just do the right thing if you can. In the meantime, McKee did pick up some endorsements this week, which I think are pretty key and in some ways surprising. The NEA decides that they're with McKee. If you've been following the NEA and McKee for a long time, you know that this is almost antithetical in the sense that Dan McKee is one of the creators and, and organizers and leaders and thinkers on charter schools, which is something the teachers union does not like. So clearly, there has been a move here. And while some opposite uh, you know, opponents would say, well, he's bought it. You know, he bought it with the vaccines and blah, 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 blah. The truth of the matter is that uh, this NEA has done a contemplative look at this governor's race and made a very interesting decision. Um, along with the AFL-CIO. Uh, so for those of you who think labor matters in elections, take note, uh, because it does. Uh, now, as I've told you, candidly, you know, I'd like to see Dan McKee elected. He's a friend of mine. Um, I think I see everybody else's point of view in a, in a fairly practical way. So this notion that uh, McKee's in trouble in this race, I think, is due to having no advertising for a long time. The mother ad that is run, and we talked about it last week, I think is uh, kind of changed some disposition. This is going to be a horse race right to the end. Um, and of course, everyone is trying to whip their horse. And guess who the new horse is for Atlanta folks? Jorge Alorza, who for some reason thinks he's on some kind of a ride here. Uh, he has his own poll that tells him that he's 60% favorable in his own city. Uh, which is interesting. He's not running, running again. Uh, he's convinced some members of the media that this is newsworthy. Um, but uh, he and Congressman Patrick Kennedy uh, stepped up today. It's 1 o'clock on Thursday. You see this on Friday on Fox and on Channel 12 on Sunday nights.
But Thursday afternoon, uh, Thursday morning, Patrick Kennedy came in. This is my state. This is our state. We need fresh. Patrick, you don't live here anymore. I know the family's legacy, but in a way, it's kind of yesterday's news, but good to see it. Anyway, speaking of endorsements, uh, Jim Langevin, the sitting congressman, uh, is moving on. He's decided this is no longer a place he wants to, to be. And he, interestingly, he endorsed Seth Magaziner, the state treasurer, uh, who in all the polls leads. Uh, Joy Fox is, I don't know, are you a distant second? Are, in, in this, in the, how, would we, how would we describe I, I describe it as we're right in the mix, and right. we've got we've still of got. Of course 30. you will. We've got, you need to. <laughs> of yes. course you right do. Right in the mix, and you know what? It's it's the undecided that makes me feel that way. I mean, the last time we had any numbers on it, I think it was around forty five percent undecided. Correct. So I think that there is still a lot of conversations to have. I think we're under fifty days now, maybe at this point, towards the September thirteenth primary. Right. Um, and you know, with the with the new pandemic, the voting rules now, August twenty fourth, I think is when early voting starts as well. Mm -hmm. So. We're out there every day. I'm out there every day uh, talking to people and just making the case that Rhode Island needs to be represented by, um, for the first time, a Democratic woman from Rhode Island. And it's, it's been great. So um, I didn't say welcome. Yeah, I didn't either. Thanks for having me. <laughs> we jumped right yeah, in. Yeah, we're working here. We're working here. We're, <laughs> exactly. we're, we're, you know, it's, uh, we're working here. Exactly. Uh, yeah, as I said in the open, um, you're, uh, you're one of those and I don't see this often, and I don't say this often. Uh, in fact, for the more than two decades I've been here and the more than four decades I've been doing this kind of work, I think on my one hand, I could probably count the number of candidates that I've said would really, really be great for the job. I don't know if they can get there from here, the old Vermont saying, right? How do you get there from here? Uh, we should talk about that a little bit. But first, before we get there, tell everybody what you've done. I mean, you, you've, you've been um, somebody familiar to all of the media because of your comms work. Uh, you worked for Jim Langevin. Uh, you worked for Gina Raimondo. Mm -hmm. And you were really effective at your job. Translation, what part of that resume really sticks, do you think, in this gig? that you would like to have. Yeah, thank you, and, and thank you for having me. Um, I mean, the bottom line, like you, I care about the state. I care about the state deeply and have always been willing to jump in, roll up my sleeves, and tackle those challenges. I grew up in Cranston. I live in Warwick now. Uh, my parents still live in the house that we all grew up in. Oldest of five kids, um, an aunt to a, two nephews and a niece. And um, I've covered every You're bit of this. You're such an old-fashioned family girl. <laughs> No, you well, are. I, I mean, it's, it's part I, of your charm. Yeah, I mean, I mean no, really, the family. The I don't know if it's thing, charm, but I truly, I love my family. No, no, no. <laughs> it, 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 no, but it, in fact, yeah. you actually used as part of your. I should have pulled it. Your your announcement. I'm running for this. The, you were running for people. You were running for yeah. people in your family. Yeah. And when I said, being candid, I thought yeah. it was a little cheesy. I, I, it, it, you know, you, you, you but get, my family reflects this district, and I think that's what makes me competitive here. Okay. Is that um, I am from here, and I understand deeply the challenges that folks are facing here um, and the work that needs to happen to keep all of our families here and working. Um, I think everyone should should have the opportunity to live and raise their family here just like my parents did. Um, and that is why I'm in this race because I do believe deeply in the power of government to still do good things for people here. Um, and I do have that experience. Having been in the rooms where, where things have happened, um, working for Congressman Langevin and Gina Raimondo, I've covered every bit of this district, and quite frankly, in working for the governor of the state. Um, and that just gives me a unique perspective. You know, you hear that you've covered what the folks say at the podium, and then usually I was the person that they would turn to and say, okay, now let's go and figure out how to get this done and have those conversations, bring mm -hmm. those stakeholders around the table. So everything from um, either working with Congressman Langevin, when I worked with him, the passage of the Affordable Care Act happened, and two other things happened too while we were there, which are still um, things that I'd like to continue there. Work for unpaid, unpaid family caregivers. Um, my family has, my dad has Alzheimer's, my mom's his primary caregiver. We'd be absolutely lost without the respite that the Cranston Adult Day Services provide. More families need that, and they need it now more than ever, as we've seen with the pandemic. I mean, we need to be able to help families go to work, stay in work, support their families if they want to. It's real. It's, I mean, it's, it's beyond It's real. real. When, yeah. when you have, and you know, we lived through it, you know, when my mom, my mom was a quadriplegic for the last 20 years of her yeah, life. Sorry. And 
um, I, 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 I don't bring it up for yeah. purposes of empathy, no, but, but I, I, and I appreciate you saying that, but it, we hired a full-time caregiver. Yeah. You had that we were yeah. we well yeah I'll tell you it 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 it, it, it took a, a very upper middle class family to yeah. not so upper middle class by the time it was done you know, yeah. um, but without that yeah. I just don't know yeah I, I, I we, the the last twenty years of her life might have been two seriously yeah. simply yeah. because of the full court press that has to go on with people who are ill at home and, and elderly and so and the key there is at home and I think that is what helps my dad and as you just mentioned helped your mom. It's home is where you want to be, especially when you're sick. Um, and as family members, that's where we want them. So how can we help support families who would like to keep their loved ones at home? Last night, though, I was out knocking on doors um, in Cranston, and a woman answered the door. And we got talking about the same issue in the same way. Mm -hmm. And her mom has Alzheimer's now as well. And But she realized that home wasn't the best setting for her mom. And so her, on the other side of it, was what are we doing to support the facilities that our families are in and making sure on both sides how we have the trained, dedicated, and well-paid workforce there mm -hmm. to help support us both for living at home and, and in the care setting. All right, complicated stuff. We'll yeah. hit some more issues and talk about the politics of this race. Stay with us. So I mentioned Congressman Landrigan and his endorsement of Seth Magaziner. We just kind of got away from you know, talking stuff that matters. Um, was that a hit for you, that, that, that being a former employee and a valued employee? And I know how, how strongly uh, Jim Landrigan felt about your, your success with his business. So what happened? What happened there? Um, well, you'd have to ask him what happened, but yes, it was extremely, did you ask him what happened? extremely disappointing. We did have a conversation, and I expressed that it was it's disappointing, but I doesn't change the fact that I'm extremely proud of the work that I did with him on behalf of Rhode Island Second Congressional District, um, one of my one of the best teams that we've ever that I've ever worked on. I'm still all very close today. So look, if, so. if if I take a mercenary approach to this, and sometimes yeah. you have to, I, uh, my guess is that his answer was, you know, I love you, Joy, but look, the the data is the data, and magazine looks magazine looks like the the odds on favor, and I can't not endorse him and and, and rip away that momentum going into a general election with Alan Fung. Uh, and the powers that be in the Democratic Party, more or less, you know, put it to me, and I, I see that. I mean, that's the business of politics that makes mm -hmm. it difficult. I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to figure out why he did that. If you had a closer race, polling data-wise, mm -hmm. uh, in, in this thing, it may make that endorsement a little bit more uncomfortable. You kind of lead a pack. Do we have uh, we we have some some graphics, some of which you can't really read, but the last couple of polls between WPR and the Boston Globe. Uh, you see uh, Seth Magaziner with a significant lead in the 30% range, and then there's you kind of leading a pack. I, I, I'm a horse race guy. I, I visualize, you know, that somebody went out really out far out front, and then there's a pack of chasers. And I'm sure, as in horse races, you would like to narrow that gap and make it somewhat of a, a sprint to the finish. Um, examine that data for me and tell me why it makes it still feel like you have a reason yeah, to like finish this 50 days and, and, mm -hmm. and have a fighting chance. Yeah, like we like we said at the top of the show, it's that undecided. Um, True, I mean, it, it was, I what, 40-plus percent undecided? Right, yeah, in the last Boston Globe poll, I think it was around 45 percent. Um, and that is a real gap. And we've also not seen the, the front runner there it, numbers explode away from us either. You see the, the bottom of the pack creeping up while he stays pretty steady. And I think that goes to a couple of things. Um, it is, uh, he's the insider favorite and people are tired of that right now. Um, he is someone that said that he would move into this district and is yet to do it. And yeah. why, why would he? I mean, he lives in the East Side. He's like 150 yards from the district. But right? if this comes down why to one vote, and he can't vote for himself, Dan. <laughs> I mean, right? We've got. <laughs> so, and okay. that's right. right? Hey, uncle, that's a problem. <laughs> that's There's a problem. no problem. I get that. That's a problem. So, yeah. I mean, there aren't just. And you can trust me as someone that. That should be that, one of your ads. <laughs> you should have some fun with These are my consultancy. Yeah. Yeah. Have some fun with it. Say, hey, look, you may not think it's a big deal. But when it comes down to him and we're tied, he's screwed. I yeah. mean, that might be something very funny yeah. to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you raise a good point. I will, I will make a call after the show yeah. to do that. No, but, no, I, I mean, it's serious. It comes in all seriousness. It is. We should remember, would, you know. point out to everybody: you don't have to live in the district to right. run it. Uh, by constitutional law, but no, but you do to vote for yourself. But you do to vote. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know that's really fascinating. I never really went 
to that. I mean, it's not a big leap to, to think about the fact that he can't vote for himself. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, but I do think it is important. I mean, look, these are challenging times right now. And to have someone that believes in this, this community and has grown up here and sees the not only the challenges that we need to fix, but Dan, I also think there's a lot of great things. And we need to tell those stories down in D.C. as well and make sure that Rhode Island is well represented by someone who, who is, has those deep roots and knows how to make a difference. All right, well, we'll get back to some of the reasons why to vote for you in, in our final segment. But in, on the politics of this thing, has there been any commiseration amongst the four challengers uh, David Siegel, Sarah Morgenthau, no, Omar Ba, for you guys all to look and say, hey, which mm -hmm. one of us, is there a feeling of us against the uh, the chosen one at all yeah. amongst you guys? You'd or? have to ask them. There hasn't been. Um, Do you think I about mean, it? I, I, well, I think about how, um, you know, this is, I am not the insider here. I am the one, but I do believe that I'm the most But if you were running one-on-one -on -one with Seth Magaziner, yeah. I think you'd be wholly more formidable. You've got four or five, you've got three other people who are also grabbing three and five and seven right. percent. And that's just the reality away. of a primary. That's the reality of a competitive right. primary. That's what we knew going into it. Um, and for me, it is about having conversations like this. It is out knocking doors, going to events, talking to people, as many people as I can, um, to make the case to close that 45 percent gap. Um, I do think that... There is some. There is a choice here for voters. Well, the close was really about a 20 percent gap. Not even. Right. Uh, it's a 22, 23 percent gap, with the 45 percent. The math is hard. I mean, yeah. you'd have to pick out. You'd have to win two out of every three undecided votes in order to be able to get this thing right. done. Um, if that polling data is true, the other thing we got to be careful of: the polling data is now you know, six weeks and a month old. And I don't know what other polling data is going to be available. Have yeah. you polled? Have you been able no, to? Not. You're not. We you're shaving your dough to be able to get your message across, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. So when we come back, why don't we just uh, talk about the message and, and, and stop worrying about the data and talk about why this candidate might be your choice? Stay with us. All right. Uh, issues. This sent. A, I don't know. A, blow hold to the side of uh, every barge out there <laughs> uh, last month, huh? Uh, this thing is, is, is going to be, I still think, even though people immediately return to exhaustion on, on the issue, like I, I raised a question on the radio yesterday about abortion through the Michigan football coach who said that if my players ever got into a situation with an unwanted pregnancy, I would raise the child in my own home. And I was like, what? But... Um, so the debate on the Supreme Court decision last month was crazy, but it was like two weeks in lasting because people get exhausted by the abortion discussion. Yet, I still think in the back of people's minds, it's going to be a very high profile thing, certainly in the general election with Alan Fung, the Republican, having to finally s spit it out and be clear and succinct about where he stands on any congressional revisit of this matter. Talk to me about it. Um, you call it a hole in the side of the barge and, for me, a gut punch in talking to my, my friends um, as well and family members. A, a, an unbelievable um, punch in the gut and, um, and in talking to, in particular, friends who are OBGYNs, um, all of them um, talking about what to do and, and so on and so forth. But then at the end of those conversations, the resolve of we will keep treating our patients and doing what's right, um, and we will keep moving forward. And but easier to say, and, and all due respect to their, their fine professions, here in a blue state where there will be even more codification, I'm sure, by the time we're done, that thing, the, the, the issue of, of choice and, and, and abortion rights will be so codified in Rhode Island, you won't be able to, it'll be almost airtight. Unless, of course, we get a federal law that mm -hmm. completely makes it illegal, and then we'll have a right. civil war. Right. Uh, and and Congress that's why it's up this to Congress. year has yeah. got to make you know yeah. a call that's why one way or the has other to, on it. Has to protect a woman's right and a right to abortion. Con this is up to Congress now. Um, and let's be clear: this is a matter of privacy, and this is a matter of a trust of trust between a woman and her doctor. And that is something extremely serious. And well, listen, um, you're you're you're, you're, you're an old-fashioned. Are you Catholic? Are you Catholic? I am. Yeah. So it's hard. It's hard for Catholics. I'm a Catholic. I'm a pro-life guy. If someone talked to me about abortion, I would do everything I could to convince them to please keep that life. But I can't unsolicitedly enter into that arena. 
Uh, I've, I've learned that over time. And the thing that bothers me most and, 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 and makes it m even more uncomfortable is the idea that depending on what interstate you live on or what exit you come off of that interstate, yeah. you are either going to be able to have a health care decision that is legal or something that could put you in jail. In this country, I can't believe yeah, we're doing that. Yeah, and it can't be driven by your economic status and your geography. And, you know, when you say that it'll be airtight here in Rhode Island, I hope so. Um, but, again, back to my friends who are doctors, we, we've got questions of shield laws. If someone comes in from out of state, are, my, are those women, are those practitioners protected as well? There, so let's, this has many different angles So let's to make it. a point on this election. This election in, is not going to ride on whether or not you can, uh, you know, put a stop sign on uh, an intersection in the middle of Cranston. This is going to be about the big picture. So yes. you've got 60 seconds here. Talk about the big picture and why you're somebody that people ought to think about. Thank you. Um, for all the reasons that we've talked about, I'm from here. I understand the challenges that we're facing. And it is high time for everything we just talked about to send the first Democratic woman from Rhode Island to Congress, a woman that grew up here, who understands the issues here, and who also grew up in Cranston. I was on a team that um, beat the presumptive um, general election nominee there twice, and I think we can do it a third time. And I think we can do it by pointing out where we need better leadership than what he provided in the city of Cranston. As a kid that grew up going to the Bud Long Pool, it's unacceptable right now that that pool is closed, and it's a huge symbol of the type of leadership that we cannot afford to have in Washington, D.C. Hmm. Well, he's not the mayor right now. He didn't close no. the pool this year. No, but it was closed prior to that. Yeah, yes. I mean, I try to get yeah. that pool open three times a Sunday. I got yeah. 15 seconds. Why is the yeah. woman thing so important in this decision? Different perspective. Um, our delegation does great things, but now it's time to bring a different perspective to the table, especially when we're talking about women's economic security and health, health care. Everyone deserves access to affordable health care. As a woman, I think that we need to bring that perspective to the table now. You're in this thing all the way to the end? All the way to the You're end. You're coming up with advertising soon? You, I mean, are there we're buys coming? We're going to do everything that we need to do to make, get this case across. I like the ad. Hey, if it's a dead heat, he can't vote for himself. <laughs> Just saying. Good luck, kiddo. Thank you. Thanks. Final word. We come back. Let's do this. So we got some GDP numbers out that say that we could be in a recession. I will tell you, just as institutional respect and belief has changed, be careful about what you believe is true. Even though a lot of people are struggling for all sorts of reasons coming out of the pandemic, the definitions and the economic formulas, they're all brand new. So keep a smile on your face. See you on the radio weekdays 3 to 6 on WPR. I'm back here next week. Bye.